No longer can civilized people take pleasure in public executions, tortures, burning at the stake as in former times. Whatever competition may remain between Christian brethren, the peril is not that of open persecution, for general sentiment has advanced beyond the point where physical torture could be tolerated by the masses. We have come to the time when Calvinists erect a monument to Servetus, expressing dissent from their great leader's mistake in causing a Christian brother to be burned. We have come to the place where the perils amongst false brethren are of a different kind. Now, whatever jealousies or rivalries there may be, either at home or in the mission fields, are recognized as improper and suppressed, so far as brethren connected with popular and influential bodies of Christians are concerned. But is it not true today that the truth is unpopular? Has this not always been the fact? Is it not true that in proportion as the denominations have become popular, they have escaped persecution? But woe be to those who are unpopular, as were Jesus and the apostles. If they indeed escape the cross, the guillotine, the rack, and the faggot, they are amenable to other means of torture. Something can be trumped up against their personality. Insinuations can be given by word and look and shrug of shoulder. More damage can be accomplished in this way than in any outward attack. Evil speaking, evil surmising, slanders, ambiguous suggestions, and so forth, all as torture, can be applied to the followers of Jesus today. And all who today take such a course are sharers with the male factors, even though they do not indulge in physical torture. Who can dispute that sometimes mental torture is equally severe? In our day there are other and more refined ways of persecuting, torturing, open to false brethren, than imprisonment or crucifixion or burning. And what shall we say of the false brethren who do such things? And how shall we assure ourselves that we shall not be of them? Undoubtedly the Master is still of the same mind as St. John expressed when he declared, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. 1 John chapter 3 verse 15 Murderers may indeed receive severe stripes and eventually learn better under Messiah's kingdom, but no one of a murderous condition of heart, seeking to do evil to a brother, could possibly be of a suitable character to be a joint heir with his master in the kingdom. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 9 through 11 in every time and now, the spirit of persecution naturally would strike most prominently certain leading figures. Nevertheless, even as Jesus' words implied, all lovers of righteousness are to have more or less share in such experience of opposition. St. Paul mentions this, saying, Ye endured a great fight of afflictions, partly whilst ye were made a gazing stock, and partly whilst she became companions of them that were so used. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 32 and 33. Jesus gives us the same thought in his declaration that whosoever shall offend one of the least of these, his disciples, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Matthew chapter 18 verse 6. This of course is very highly figurative language and yet it must have a special meaning. It must mean that the Lord has a special care over all of his consecrated saints, and that no matter how poor, how weak, how ignorant they may be, the very least of his followers are supervised, and injury to the least is punishable. Of course, there would still be an awakening from the dead for the one who was drowned in the sea, and so there are possibilities of help and recovery for those who would stumble the Lord's little ones. Nevertheless, the intimation is that of drastic punishment. This would not mean anything like we once supposed, eternal torment, but some just recompense of reward for every evil deed. 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 9 From this standpoint, we may readily assume that considerable satisfaction of justice is necessary. For surely a considerable number of the Lord's little ones have suffered persecution. And as we have seen, not all of this persecution lies at the door of the world. 
Much of it lies at the door of the professed Church of Christ, false brethren. Isaiah chapter 66 verse 5, Matthew chapter 7 verses 21 through 23. Speaking of some such, Jesus once declared that they would have great disappointment when the time of rewards would come. He says, Many shall say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and done many wonderful works? And I will declare, I do not recognize you. They will not be worthy of the Lord's recognition as amongst his elect church, his bride class. We shall be glad if they will be found worthy of some blessing under his kingdom. But there will be great disappointment to them. They miss the greater point of the gospel, love. The Lord's will concerning all his followers is that they should love one another as he loved them. St. John expressed this sentiment, saying that as Jesus loved the church and laid down his life for the church, so also his followers should lay down their lives for the brethren. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. If this is the love standard that the Lord has set for his people, how sorely some will soon be disappointed in respect to his will if they have ignored this requirement. If, instead of loving the brethren and laying down their lives for them, they say all manner of evil against them, etc., what then? Then they are false brethren. Then they are the peril of the true brethren. Oh, how much the true followers of Jesus need to impress upon themselves this great lesson, that love does no ill to his neighbor, that love is sympathetic, suffereth long, and is kind, vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, seeketh not merely its own interests and welfare, but seeketh the interest and welfare of others. The supreme test of our loyalty to God is our love for him, and this love is manifested by our desire to do those things acceptable to him. There is little that we really can do for the Almighty. He is so great and we are so small. But if we have his spirit of love, then we shall love all those who love him, and our conduct toward them will demonstrate the real sentiment of our hearts. Thus seen, we are daily making our reward in the Lord's sight, daily showing him to what degree we are worthy or unworthy of his great reward. Those mentioned in our text as false brethren were perilous to the true brethren, but did not get into this position immediately. It was a growth, a development. The wrong spirit gradually supplanted the right. It is well that Christians note this insidious canker which gnaws at the root of brotherly love, tends to poison the spirit and to bring forth the evil fruitage mentioned. Apparently, in some cases, the spirit of pride, the spirit of sectarianism, the spirit of ambition, are the leading features of the wrong course, which, if permitted to go to the heart, will develop a bad fruitage, such as we are discussing. It will produce false brethren, persecuting brethren, blind to the real spirit of their master. Heady, high-minded. Jude 11, Genesis chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Let us then, beloved, be more and more on guard against the encroachments of the adversary upon us as new creatures. Let us be more and more zealous for the spirit of our master and show forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. In no way can we better show forth these praises than by exemplifying in our daily conduct the lessons we have learned of him.